<laughs> just to set expectations, this is a sort of 101 level talk, okay? We're not gonna go super deep into some of the patterns, we're not gonna go super deep into some of the config, but hopefully you walk away with a good understanding of resilience, good understanding of reliability, uh, and then you've got some tips and tricks that you can use with Linkerd and with Emissary Ingress as well. And also a good understanding of what each of these things actually brings to the table, what rate limits can accomplish, what retries accomplish, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect. I'm Daniel. This is Flynn. We have worked together for five plus years. Something there were different like that, companies yeah. and communities and so forth, uh, very active in the open source community. Love to get involved in the Twitters. You can jump on our respective Slacks, engage with us as well. You know, don't you know, Feel free to come up just at the end of the talk, but don't uh, worry, you can always engage with us online as well. I'm always happy to chat afterwards. It's also worth pointing out for those of you who might know me from the past, the, uh, that at Buoyant, that is not a typo. I am at Buoyant now, not at Ambassador Labs before. <laughs> Fantastic, so resilience. When I always like to think about the, you know, why are we doing this stuff, right? I'm a technologist, you know, Java programmer by heart, by background, um, but I always like to think, why are we thinking about a thing? Why should we care about reliability? Why should we care about resilience, right? The user wants that reliable end-to-end -end experience, but they don't really want to know about the, the details, right? They just want the web app to work. They want to get a good, you know, good user experience, right? You've got to handle north-south and east-west traffic when you're dealing with microservices. Back in my Java monolith days, north-south, traffic coming from the user to the monolith, happy days, right? As we split up to microservices, I started to get Ruby, but it'd go, all these other things. Suddenly, I was implementing libraries to manage all the comms between the services. We've pulled that out, things like observability, security, and re resilience within the application now can be done by a service mesh, east-west. So got to think now, north, south, east-west. Uh, as we'll demonstrate, as Flynn will demonstrate, the patterns do differ whether you're at the edge or within the mesh. So some little gotchas, little takeaways we'll go through there. And despite what you're hearing at the conference, DevOps is not dead, right? <laughs> um, and self-service is required, is my pitch, right? And that, um, as a developer, I've been an operator too, right? But I want to be able to do my work without interacting with unnecessary tickets, you know, Jira, all this kind of stuff, right? I just want to do my work, basically, whether I'm dev or ops. Probably also worth pointing out that north, south, and east, west have different patterns but they are all required. You don't get to just go, oh, I've got resilience up on the north-south level, I'll just ignore east-west. That does not work. You have to think about it all the way through. Perfect, Seven. perfect, Seven. If you have not bumped into this book by Mike Nygaard, it is amazing. Check it out, Pragmatic <laughs> Programmers. Um, he goes into resilience patterns, like our standard design patterns, right? Um, second edition of the book is out now. I learned so much from the first edition, it was like 10 years ago, uh, and it's been updated with microservices with cloud um, in mind, although it is a technology agnostic book. It goes through uh, retries, timeouts, rate limits, which we're gonna cover today with Edge, uh, sorry, the Emissary Ingress and with Linkerd. It also goes through things like bulkheads. Now, if you think in the Kubernetes land, that's like your quotas, your resource quotas, right? You don't want things overwhelming or consuming too many resources. Circuit breakers, you can do like in the mesh, that you can do um, in terms of, like, say, Envoy, do a lot of work on Envoy. There is a mesh sort of or, or proxy level circuit breaking. And if you're from the Java world, and I'm sure other worlds as well, there's application level circuit breaking. Things like Hystrix from the Netflix stack. I did a lot of work with Hystrix. Spring have got a very similar uh, pattern. We're not going to cover bulkheads and circuit breakers today, but like Flynn said, they are an important thing in the toolbox. This yep. is kind of a 101 talk, but do bear in mind there's other patterns out there. Excellent. Uh, quick intro to Emissary Ingress. It is an open source CNCF project, incubation level. If you haven't heard of it, do check out you know, the website, the GitHub uh, site, pop along with active Slack channel as well. It's all about getting your user traffic into your backend services. It is an edge gateway, API gateway, call it what you will. But the main thing is about getting that user traffic into the backend. Wide adoption thing, like you have been coding on it for since Inception, you were the lead engineer, right? Since 2017. Yeah, so it's battle tested, right? That's one of the things like, you know, there's many sort of ingresses out there, but this is battle tested. It's used at massive scale at various different companies. Um, it's Envoy powered under the hood. So we all know and love Envoy. And we've wrapped that on top with the, the North South use case in mind. <clears throat> if you think about the primary role of an ingress of an API gateway, it is literally mapping from, we've got Jane in this example, quote, to a relevant backend service, right? We've also got Mark here, 
going through to the back-end service. From a security perspective, we might want to stop that. We might have some auth in, in place, right, to stop that happening. Or that X might actually represent something breaking within the application, right? And that's where you need observability, rate limiting, resilience, app development focus. We're mainly focusing on the middle two today, the rate limiting and the resilience, with the app development sort of mindset as well. But this is the role of on ingress. You're getting that user traffic front to back. In terms of configurations, this, you know, if you configured any kind of proxy before, any kind of API gateway, this should not be a big uh, sort of change for you. This is our custom resource mapping right back end service. You can also go a bit fancy. You can do canarying with weights, 10% of traffic. Uh, you can also add timeouts, which we're going to cover, right? And you can go even deeper with labels, which we'll use for rate limiting, which I'll explain uh, a bit later. You also need to set up things like the listener, right? Listening to ports. You're going to be setting up the host, probably some TLS and so forth as well. Uh, and of course, you want to set up the rate limit service, which we'll walk you through later. Uh, and all of this, you'll notice, is via Kubernetes YAML custom resources, right? You, whatever your pipeline is, GitOps or, or CI pipeline, CD pipeline, you can push your like deployments, your services down that. You can push this config down that as well, which is what I love about this kind of, you know, both uh, from the Linkerd and from the Emissary's perspective, it's Kubernetes native, which is, which is great. Just something to think about, right? Like, there is different personas at work here. Jane, our, ops, our dev persona, and Julian, our ops persona. You can split the workloads, right? And that the operator sets the guardrails, sets the defaults, and then me as a developer, I go in and do my day-to-day -day work without needing to constantly bug them. So think about this, you know, there's often, like, be it security, be it observability, be it, in our case, resilience, the two personas work in hand in hand, but there's often different ways of configuring the tools, which we'll show a bit today as well. Think of that point, Lynn, I'll hand over to you. It's always interesting to hear Daniel do that one rather than me doing that one. It's Nice job. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is the Linkerd shock and awe slide. Lots of logos and numbers and things like that. This is the real takeaway. Linkerd is a service mesh. It's all about mediating, monitoring, and adapting the east-west traffic from service to service. Linkerd's purpose in life is to give you what you need to create highly secure, reliable, observable cloud-native applications and to make those tools available free of charge. Um, all of the logos back there thought that this was a good idea. All of the people starring the GitHub repo thought that was a good idea. I'd also like to point out, we are currently the only CNCF graduated service mesh, where that means that we are considered as mature as Kubernetes itself is. Um, Emissary, and Ingr Emissary Ingress and Linkerd work out really nicely together. From Linkerd's perspective, Emissary is just another workload in the mesh. From Emissary's perspective, Linkerd is just another chunk of the Kubernetes networking layer. So you can literally just stick the two of them in the same cluster and they start working together, which is really lovely. Awesome. Uh, I think, oh yes, sorry. I should point out the way Linkerd works is by injecting these proxies next to each of the services and then having it, have arranging things so that Kubernetes will route all of the traffic service to service through the proxies. There's also a control plane that keeps track of what the proxy is supposed to be doing. And that's really kind of all there is to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you were going to talk yeah, about the demo good. architecture. So we'll now dive into some code. Flynn's going to be doing some live coding, so hope the demo gods are with us. But just to set this up, this is the very simple architecture we've set up just to provide a realistic kind of use case, right? We have our faces GUI uh, talking through emissary. Uh, actually, well, let me back up. Sorry, apologies. Just in terms of, like, I'll go the other way. The smiley service is responsible for sending back smileys, okay? Deep in our call graph. The color service is responsible for sending back colors. The face service aggregates these together. So you get green smiley face, right? When everything is working well, that's what we get. In theory, we should see lots of this in the browser when we do the demo. Yeah. <laughs> and then going back in again, you imagine we're calling through our faces GUI, it's a single page web app, through emissary into the back end. And you'll notice then there is lots of lovely linkies, our lobster from Linkerd, uh, acting as a sidecar uh, next to the services. That's the service mesh part. Then I think back to you. This is what you should always see when we're running this demo. Lots and lots of smiley faces on a green background. This is not what we're going to see at the start. Let me just be clear about that. Um, 
There are a lot of different things that you might see. The cursing face when the smiley service is broken. You can see a gray background when the color service is broken. You can see the exploding head if the faces application, the faces service itself just has been completely overwhelmed. You can see this sort of thing for timeouts. One of the things that was deeply fascinating about this was we have three services and I legit, even though I'm the one who wrote all three of these things and put the whole thing together, there were points where I had to use all of the tools, both on the emissary side and the Linkerd side to figure out what was going on in my own demo, even with just three applications. This stuff gets very, very complex very quickly, which is what we're gonna look at now. Uh, oh yes, one other thing. The web app is actually willing to show the user old data if the services are responding. Uh, for our purposes in the demo, you'll see that little counter ticking up when it has had something that's a little confusing but decided, it's okay, I can keep showing this data, it'll be all right. All right, let's see if the demo, demo. goes through with us. Um, I'm not actually going to show the installation of Emissary and Linkerd and all that. We have this, we have a cluster running. It's actually, in this case, is a K3D cluster running on this laptop. Could be anything, doesn't really matter. We've got our single page web app running here. Um, we would like to see a grid of smiley faces on green backgrounds, and you will notice that we are not, in fact, seeing that. Places where you see the cell just vanish are because something just took way too long and the web app gave up. The red background is where we couldn't even talk to the face service. So I guess let's go ahead and get started here. The first thing we can do is we can see if we can get rid of that bit with the frowny face on the red background. We're going to do that by telling Emissary to do retries automatically if an error comes back from the face service. So the lines in green there, we're adding a retry policy to the mapping for the face service so that we're basically telling Emissary, if you get any 5xx response, retry it. Only retry it once, but retry it. Now, let's go ahead and apply that one. Um, we are telling Emissary to only retry once just because that makes it a little bit simpler to reason about what's going on. We don't necessarily expect that that will get rid of all of these errors because we only get one retry. It's possible to you know, get a failure a retry and then immediately get another failure. But you can already see from applying this, we have a lot fewer of those simply by telling Emissary, go ahead and do the retry. Also notice, we haven't changed anything at all in the application. All we have changed is a bit in our, in our API gateway. So let's see if we can get rid of the cursing face from the smiley service. We'll do exactly the same thing. We'll tell Emissary to do a retry. Um, any guesses as to what should happen here? Anybody? All right, let's do that differently. Raise your hand if you think this will work. Nobody. <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you think it won't work. Uh-oh, nobody's willing to commit at <laughs> <Nice>. all. <laughs> Let's find out. Um, in point of fact, it does not work. It has absolutely no effect. And the reason for this is the call from the face service to the smiley service, if you remember the way the app was put together, it doesn't go through emissary at all. It happens past emissary. Emissary has no ability to affect this. So instead, we will tell Linkerd to retry that. Things are a little bit different in terms of the, the configuration. <laughs> on the emissary that. side, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, on the emissary side, we had to tell it, right, so retry on a 5xx, and you get to do one retry. And on the Linkerd side, we just say, yeah, yeah, this is retryable. Um, there, you can control this more. We don't need to in this case. That basically is telling Linkerd, yeah, any of the 5xx's will retry. Linkerd has a concept of a retry budget where it will just keep retrying until you go over the retry budget. By default, I believe that's 20%. As long as not more than 20% of the traffic is coming from retries, Linkerd will keep retrying. Uh, you can tune that, but often you don't really need to. And you can see from applying that, that, hey, look, now we're getting a bunch of smiley faces and no cursing. No cursing is good. <laughs> we can repeat the same thing and see if we can make the gray colors go away. And yeah, the answer is they go away 
from retrying things. You'll also notice every so often we still see that red background, because again, Emissary is only doing one retry. We could go through and play with a number of retries. We could tell Emissary it's okay to do two retries. We could tell it five, you know, whatever. Um, some of them will probably always be able to sneak through a little bit, and so that's a, a thing to be aware of. We still have a bunch of cases where things are taking too long and the cell is just fading off. So let's go through and do some timeouts here. We're gonna do timeouts from the other direction. Retries, we started at the top of the call graph and worked our way down just to demonstrate that you can do this the other direction with timeouts. We're gonna start deep in the call graph and then work our way back up. The other thing that's worth pointing out here is adding timeouts is not really about protecting your services. Adding timeouts is about giving your client the ability to do something when it takes too long and making it easy for the client. It's giving your client some agency to decide, to decide what to do. In this particular case, if the face service can't talk to the color service, it'll start showing it as a pink background because it took too long. So we see some pink backgrounds here. We also see that there are already fewer cells vanishing because now there's less stuff taking too long. We can do exactly the same thing for the smiley service, where we'll see the sleeping face if things start taking too long. And even at this point, we don't really see any more of those cells just vanishing and staying vanished. We can, of course, do the same thing at the emissary layer. So we can just tell emissary, hey, whatever's going on deep in the call graph there, if it takes you too long to hear back from the face service, just go and, and give up on that. And in this particular case, this is where we'll start seeing those counters appear, where everywhere there, the GUI has decided, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna show some old data here. Uh, that, that counter is really just there for demos. Did you also notice the one up there in the upper, sorry, some of these where you'll see the sleeping face that's sort of grayed out? That's where the client has just decided, all right, is this, this is taking too long in general anyway. But the point here is that the client, the web app, now has the ability to decide what to do when things take too long, rather than just stalling and giving the user something weird and confusing from the user's point of view. That leaves us with rate limits, and we will let Daniel talk about rate limiting. Yeah, we got the code off on the screen, and I'm not, not there. So, well, all right, well, I'll, I'll <laughs> say one more thing here. Um, Imagine, if you will, that one of your developers has deployed something where suddenly your service gets a lot slower somewhere down on the call graph. Um, so we've just done that. We've just modified this deployment. And you'll probably see a bunch of red pop up here as the deployment recycles. Um, but now it will start exploding if things get hammered too much, like that. <laughs> perfect. And then it is the next bit of him for the, showing yeah. the rate. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Um, Super. So the rate limiting looks a little bit different than perhaps you might expect with the timeouts and the retries. It's like pretty self-explanatory, correct? But with the, the way we've exposed the um, functionality in the rate limiting is based on the original Lyft rate limiter. So Lyft is in the company. We all probably jumped on Lyft to get here, right? Um, the way they exposed their rate limiter was very much based on labels. The idea being you could apply a bunch of labels to a mapping that data then gets passed down to the rate limiter service that we created, or there is some out the box options too. And with that data being passed down through, you can make rate limiting decisions. So I've got some quite basic examples here. I think I've just used a generic key, right? Yeah. But you can pass, well, and by default properties such as the remote IP, the um, de uh, source and destination, a bunch of useful information gets passed down through, and you can say, hey, I want a rate limit based on this IP. I want a rate limit based on these headers being injected, for example. Very customizable. Do advise you to check out the MSRE docs because it is quite rich. And when I say rich, it can mean complicated sometimes, right? But it's not when you take a pause and, and go through it, but it isn't quite as perhaps obvious as what Flynn's already shown with the retries and the timeouts. See, this is why I'm make Dan making Daniel talk about the rate limit. <laughs> yes, thanks, Flynn. Appreciate it. Um, Anytime. <laughs> yeah. the, the good thing is, look, I've got a sample uh, rate limit app I wrote in some Go. There is an old Java one I wrote back uh, that's still out there on the interwebs as well. Um, and we'll show, we can show the code at the end, but uh, we've put the link in there. Pop along to the uh, repo. You can see I've actually used um, Honeycomb, honeycomb.io's leaky bucket 
algorithm. So very simple Go service. There's an API, protobuf API, you have to implement for the rate limiter, rate limiter service. So I generated my stubs from that, used uh, Honeycomb's leaky bucket to, I think it was eight RPS in the end, Flynn, we did, didn't we? Yeah, like and, and if you read carefully on the previous screen here, you would have noticed that the environment variable we set on the face service has it blow up at eight and a half requests per second. So, so doing, setting it, rate limiting at eight per second should give us should give us some relief. Fingers crossed. So um, everything's highly customizable. Like you, see, you, can, you can look at the labels being passed in, you can look at the headers, and make those rate limiting decisions. And I'm happy to you know, drop by the booth later on, happy to walk you through um, some of the options like there for the rate limiting. But without further ado, let's now give this a try. And we should see a lot less explosions. Now, the nature of this, you know, we have to go through and refresh all these cells, right? So they're not going to vanish immediately. But if we give it a few seconds, we should see the exploding heads go away. Yes. Ta -da! That is always good when the demo works, <laughs> right? Oh. <laughs> it's always nice. Fantastic. The last thing that we should point out here, oh, by the way, sorry, there are two last things we should point out. One is, if we turn off the counters, then that gives a better example of if you had an end user who was using this, an SBA like this, this would be more the thing that they would see, where, okay, every so often they'll get a delay, but for the most part, they're just gonna see smiley faces on green backgrounds, which is what they're supposed to see. So we have here an application that's composed of, honestly, some pretty badly behaving microservices. <laughs> These are terrible. Um, but we've been able to use Emissary Ingress and Linkerd to mitigate some of the terribleness here and overall give the user an experience that can actually be pretty good without having to go mess with the code of the application. Yep. And, you know, we did this in, what, 10 minutes? Yep. You know, just going through and, and tweaking things. Obviously, you're not actually going to fix this without fixing the application code. Agreed. Which we will not show you here. That's a little <laughs> bit outside the scope of Emissary. But the point here is that even before you fix the application code, there's an enormous amount of stuff you can do to mitigate the effects of badly behaving code and give your users a better experience. And particularly on that note, we talked earlier about the different personas, right? I've definitely worked in an ops persona where it was hard to get some of the developers to engage. And that's another problem. That, that is DevOps, right? To work on that kind of thing. <laughs> but at the same time, I had a limited set of tools available to me, uh, to me as a platform engineer, yeah. as an operator. And it got me 80% of the way there, right? There was a couple of super old, you know, really janky kind of um, heritage apps, and I could protect them in a bubble somewhat. To Flynn's point, clients then calling could interact for the most part with those as though they were reliable. You know, please do document these things, right? In terms of, you know, here be dragons kind of thing, right? And ideally fix it, to Flynn's point. But this but super old service, we just, no one went there. We just couldn't fix it, right? So we protected it in a bubble with retries, rate limits, uh, and timeouts. And as an operator, that was a good set of tools in my toolbox. Then I went and chatted to the developers. What can we do to actually make this service, you know, more, more reliable, right? And if anybody's curious, these apps, the services down in the mesh, are actually hard-coded to fail 20% of the time, which is just god off <laughs> in yeah, terms of you know, it's a terrible terrible application um and they're also hard-coded to do things like something like half the time they take longer than a second to respond yeah. so terrible metrics down there at the application level but we're still able to deliver a decent user user experience just by messing with things in the api gateway and in the service mesh so uh, please do not take this as any endorsement of a 20% failure rate being acceptable <laughs> or anything like that. <laughs> but yeah. So back to the slides and everything. And then any uh, final wrap up? Do we have more on the slides? Yeah, just a final bit of conclusion. Then we can take some there questions. There we go. We do. We do. Perfect. So just coming back sort of full circle, right? Hopefully you've taken away from this that users want the reliable software. They don't necessarily care about the internal details. That's our jobs, right, as developers, as QA, as platform engineers. You do need to think about this end-to-end, -end, but you need to, like, ideally start with the services, but in reality, you're probably going to be looking at communications, right? Like we've talked about, you want to fix things if they're broken, but it's a nice tool to have in your toolbox, and at least cloud-native communications, the north, south, east, west, think about the whole thing, right? It's very tempting, like, if you're really into your meshes, just to try and solve everything in the mesh, 
if you're really into your API gateway, just to solve everything there. But you know, something like Emissary Ingus and something like Linkerd together, hopefully you've seen that give you a lot more options, right? There is a few dragons we didn't perhaps touch on about timeouts. You can, it's very easy to mess oh, up some of the timeouts sometimes with like timeouts at the edge versus timeouts in the, in the, uh, in the mesh as well. But Happy in, but to in, talk about that afterwards if anybody wants to know some of the dragons we ran into while we were <laughs> doing this. There were a lot of them. But for the most part, I really do like the combination of the two separate things, ingress gateway and the mesh gives me the options, right? The combination is very powerful. Love it. Uh, and a mix, you know, Flynn said it perfectly at the end, right? A mix of retries, timeouts, and rate limits does genuinely go a long way. I've seen some folks get a bit too into the circuit breakers too early because they're kind of the hotness, right? Particularly in the Java world back a few years ago, everyone was loving Hystrix. And at the application level, it gives you more options again. We're at the kind of wire level here, right? We're at the, you know, service, service comms level. Um, but honestly, retries, timeouts, rate limits, I'm a big fan of keeping it simple. Yep. Yeah. Um, and make sure your solution is developer focused and self service. And that's why, you know, build on the tools that are out there, right? I've seen some folks try to actually hack all this into libraries. Um, and, you know, that can work, but I'm a big fan of like, hey, some other folks have already done this stuff. It's an open source project, there's a CNCF project. Contribute, get involved. And contributions can be docs, because definitely emissary English oh, docs God, do yes. a bit of tweaking sometimes. <laughs> so we love contributions, right? But it can be code as well. So rather than do your own thing, rather than try and push it in, you know, super ops focused or super dev focused, um, think about that, um, you know, end to end experience, developer focused, self service. And the CNCF tools are all about that. Kubernetes, Cloud Native is all about declarative self service config. One thing we didn't put on this slide that occurs to me we probably should have is just another note about the fact that, remember, the app we were demonstrating is very, very simple and shows some extremely complex behaviors as you start looking at how those different things interact with each other. So we didn't really talk about it much in this yeah, slide. Yeah. We didn't talk much about the observability and debugging part, but there are a lot of tools to help with <laughs> that as well. And it can be very, very helpful to think about this from the beginning of you developing your app rather than waiting until things are going wrong. So, yeah. 100%. Final slide, uh, references there. The main demo you can find, oh, is that updated, Finn? Or, Oops. Yeah, we'll need to update the top, uh, top don't, link. It'll... Pay no attention to the top link <laughs> we got today. Uh, and then my rate limiting service is below as well, which I've moved into the Ambassador Labs repo. Uh, hopefully self-explanatory. We've tried to document as, as good as we can, um, but always happy to take questions on, on our Slack or find me on the CNCF Slack as well. And we also have the docs for Linkerd and the docs for Emissary Ingress as well. Do let us you know, know how you get on with these things. We love feedback, we love PRs in the docs as well. If you spot something that's a bit um, incorrect or, or not super obvious, and um, we always, both, both projects, very much appreciate uh, docs PRs. There we go, now there's, uh, now there's nothing to hide on the slide. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if everyone's taking their pictures, I saw folks with a few cameras, it's great. Uh, we have a few minutes, we like do. Like we five have or so five minutes, minutes for questions, questions so. if anyone would like to chat anything out. I think a mic might be roving. Oh, thank you. Or, you know, just wander up afterwards, but always happy to take questions now. So we saw your demo where you uh, uh, came to your initial values for some of these things. And in an incident situation, is it appropriate to proactively change some of them? Uh, initial values, sorry, which ones so do you like, think? So, like, for example, uh, your, your timeout that you initially came to 250 million. Oh, yeah. Um, I am not going to lie. The timeout values that we showed in this demo have gone through probably a dozen different iterations while Daniel and I played with things. It, uh, it, it took a while to find combinations that gave really good results. Yeah, that's and <laughs> the, that's another case where the observability part yeah, plays a huge role in this one, where we'd go change something and then look at the demo and go, huh, that's funny. That's not quite what we expected to happen. Yeah. And then we'd go through and poke around through emissaries logs and the Linkerd dashboards and things like that and realize what was going on and then iterate so, and just keep going. So yeah, 100%. There's, there's a very iterative process on all this stuff. This is like watching a tennis match. Yeah, you know? <laughs> we genuinely are scouting a room. Yeah. Any other questions at all? If, if not, uh, oh, perfect. Yeah, in the retry policy, is there some way to do like a back off so it doesn't retry immediately or? Oh, um, like an exponential that, back off type yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I'm going to have to go look that up yeah. to be candid. Same, um, same as me. 
If I remember right, I believe that there is, but I'm going to have to go look that up. Okay. We, we kind of deliberately, uh, deliberately didn't want to get too deep into that for this one because we knew we'd run out of time if we did. It's, it's Excellent worth, question, though. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly. I was going to say exactly the same. <laughs> and the folks that perhaps haven't bumped into this, you've got microservices and you're doing like lots of retries and things. It's very easy to get what's called a thundering herd. Uh, we, up. Something we talked about showing and ended up deciding we didn't have time for. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Linkerd Viz dashboard when the uh, demo app is running in the first place, I wonder if I can show a bit of that. Um, I need to go reset everything here. But um, so if you look at the Viz dashboard, it will show you how many requests per second are happening to a given, you know, a given uh, service. And when we start this off with this particular demo, it hovers right around eight per second because there are 16 cells and each cell re refreshes every two seconds. As soon as you turn on retries, mm. that number goes to 9.6 because 20% of them immediately get retried because of the failure rate. So um, yeah, it's, it is really interesting to watch how some of these effects or how some of these changes have differing effects on what happens to the services. Retries and rate limits and timeouts and such tends to increase the amount of load on your service, yeah. Yeah. not decrease it. Yeah. But again, it gives your user a better experience. And so overall, it's a good trade-off to make. Yeah, and the um, Mike Nagler's book that we put up, um, it released it, it's fantastic from that perspective as well. <laughs> it talks about thundering herds, it talks about um, is it resonance in the application. You have got to think about some of these things. I've, I've definitely worked on systems where retries have actually taken down the system yeah. because it just like overloads and you get this thundering herd. <laughs> so that is a good, good question, good shout. Um, do check out that book, it's fantastic yeah. to educate you about that. Another question, sorry. Uh, hello guys, uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I'm wondering, because uh, when you look at the presentation, like the focus, you can clearly see like it's uh, towards the end user. But yes. I'm wondering when it comes to our service to service communication, have you tried it? If so, what are the do's and the don'ts? Sorry, what was exact? Sorry, what was the question? Um, I'm asking when it comes to service to service communication. Yeah. So what sh should I do or should I should not do? Uh, what should you yeah, do or not do when it comes yeah, to service? Exactly. service? So I think I'll, I'll like probably prefix the conversation for the answer by saying, oh, I always recommend thinking about the end to end, right? Yes. When I was doing more platform work, I was just like, hey, service to service, like it's really, really you know, important. But it's always think about that goal, the end user, right? Because I've actually seen folks do like timeouts and stuff in the service mesh that were completely ignored by ingress because the ingress was too tight on the timeouts, things like that. So always think about yeah. um, end to end. But probably Flynn, you probably have better answers in terms of service to service do's and don'ts. Or I can have Actually, <laughs> I think your answer was pretty good. Um, nobody runs Kubernetes just for the sake of running Kubernetes. Everybody runs Kubernetes because there's something they want to accomplish for their end user. And so starting out by thinking about, okay, how is this going to play out for the end user is the critical bit. Um, I don't know that there are any hard and fast rules in terms of what to do for service to service. Um, the way that we've been approaching it as we were working through this is all about thinking about how it's supposed to look to the end user watching this web app and then you know okay well we know that this bit is slow what can we do about this bit down here oh wait a minute if we make this bit time out like this we still have this problem that this bit behind it is too slow so maybe we can start there and focus on that bit you know right um again it's very iterative mm. It's, it's a lot of watching and observing and tweaking, but pretty much always starting out from the perspective of uh, thinking about the end user is, I think, the way to go. One final comment I had on that as well is if something looks too complicated, it probably, it probably is. Because right? <laughs> I've definitely done that where I put all these like things around the edge to protect my services. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I think I should fix this service, right? <laughs> it's <Yeah>. broken. <laughs> yeah. Ultimately, again, you know, no amount of stuff you can do in the ingress or the service mesh is going to 100% compensate for a service that's terrible, like these are. <laughs> so ultimately, you have to fix the service. Anybody else? I think we're like, it's 30 seconds left, so it's like a super fast question. Really quick question? No? Oh, oh. wait, I guess we do. Okay. Thanks for the, for the insights. 
I have sure. a question. Would it be helpful to have uh, some sort of tools to run or simulate traffic to be able to fix oh. out the right mixture of, of those parameters you've been playing with? And maybe we can throw AI at it later if in, in the future to be able to, to adjust all those parameters automatically mm. for us. Fantastic question, and that's, uh, I reckon there's a whole talk we could do on the answer to that, because <laughs> like, it's, it's a great like, load testing, soak testing, synthetic monitoring, definitely look at those kind of things. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Um, we might unfortunately have to so, ask, um, we can chat afterwards. <laughs> so much room for, yeah. for tooling around all this. But that's, of we should have mentioned that, that's actually a really good chat in terms of like, we talk yeah. about experimentation, we talk about iteration, but having like a firm kind of a benchmarking situation is, is well it's worth really investing really helpful. In. Yeah. Awesome, I think we better I wrap up or we'll be around. Thank you yep. very much for your time. Absolutely, come find us if you need more.